Okay, so today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, snake bite. We'll discuss that what are the measures that you have to do at the site of snake bite? What are the measures that you have to do in the management at home? And we'll discuss that what are the common mistakes that people do in management of snake bite? What are the do's and don'ts of snake bite? We'll discuss that what are the commonly found snakes and their management accordingly. We'll discuss that in which patients you have to give anti-snake venom and which patients you do not have to give anti-snake venom. First of all, in the management of a snake bite, if a patient got bit by snake, the first and the foremost priority is that you have to reassure the patient. As soon as they are bit by a snake, they are, they are so much worried, they are so much anxious that there is sympathetic overactivation, increased heart rate. And that is a common cause of mortality in these patients. Even in dry bites, it is seen that patients die because of the anxiety related with it. You have to reassure that not all snakes are poisonous and not all bites are venomous. And then you clean the wound with simple water. After that, immobilizing the limb is very important. Immobilizing the limb while patient is being transported from the site of bite to the hospital, this is where people do the common mistakes. And understanding it is very important. For immobilizing the limb, what you need is that you need two things. You need a splint like this, either a rod or a wood would do the job. And you need a bandage like this. Then what you need to do is that you need to place the rod or the wood or the splint underneath the limb that has been bitten by the snake. And you take the bandage and you wrap the bandage around the leg. You wrap the bandage around the leg like this. The purpose of the splint and the bandage is to immobilize the leg. And there is a second purpose to this bandage. The second purpose of the bandage is that it should be tight enough to occlude the superficial lymphatics present in the skin. It should not be very tight that it occludes the blood supply, it occludes the arterial supply of the limb. Occluding the arterial supply would do more damage, would do more harm than benefit. So the purpose of this bandage is to block superficial lymphatics and it should not be very tight. It should be tight enough that it lets one finger within. And the aim of the bandage is to block superficial lymphatics. It should not block the arterial supply. As I said, that at the point of immobilizing the limb, people do common mistakes. The old traditional methods, they do more harm than benefit. The old traditional methods of tightening a tourniquet on the limb, which has been bitten by a snake, it is very harmful. Why it is harmful? Basically, when you tighten a tourniquet on the arm or on the limb, which has been bitten by the snake, the arterial supply, the venous supply is cut off and patient starts to develop swelling in that limb. When the patient starts to develop swelling in that limb and when that patient comes to the hospital and you open up the tourniquet, there is gush of poison and venom into the circulation. And that gush of venom into the circulation causes death of the patient. So this tourniquet is a very harmful technique. So that's why we place a bandage. We place a bandage which is not tight enough to occlude the arterial supply. It is just tight enough to occlude the superficial lymphatics. Other old techniques include cutting the wound to take the poison out, squeezing the wound or sucking the poison out of the wound by mouth. These are old traditional techniques. They, they cause delay of the shift of patient from the site of bite to the hospital. So these are all redundant techniques and they are useless. They do more harm than benefit. A common presentation would be that patient would come to you in hospital, they have been bit by snake and they have tourniquet at place. They have placed the tourniquet and now you have to manage that case. Now, if the patient has tourniquet placed or tightened around the limb, now you cannot directly open the tourniquet because it will cause the gush of the poison in the whole body. What you need to do is that you have to take a BP cuff, blood pressure cuff, and you tighten it around the arm before that tourniquet, behind that tourniquet. And then you inflate the BP cuff up to the systolic blood pressure. And you keep it inflated and then you open the tourniquet. And those, then you slowly, gradually, over some time, you slowly and gradually deflate the BP cuff. 
deflating the bp cuff slowly and gradually would cause entry of poison slowly into the body so that body can cope up with it inflating the bp cuff and then deflating it over a longer period of time would cause the poison to gush slowly into the body so that's the purpose of bp set in a patient who has already applied a tourniquet so this was all the management cleaning the wound and immobilizing the patient that's what you do when the patient is outside the hospital when the patient has been shifted to the hospital you approach the patient with abc approach you check the blood pressure you check the pulse you check the temperature of the patient an important vital that you have to take with these vitals is single breath count what is single breath count single breath count tells us about the respiratory reserves many patients are bit by snakes that have neurotoxins in them those neurotoxins can cause respiratory paralysis that respiratory paralysis would cause decreased respiratory reserve and these patients will need a ventilator so to assess that that patient is having respiratory paralysis or not you ask the patient to take a simple breath and count up to 30 what they do is they take simple breath and then they count up to 30 like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 they just go up to 30 a normal person can count up to 30 in a single breath if a patient is now counting up to 20 it means that he is progressing toward respiratory paralysis if the patient can now count up to 15 in a single breath it means that his respiratory reserves are going down and this patient will need ventilator after that you have to take brief history from the patient commonly found snakes in our region other than the snakes that used to be present in the libraries of medical colleges and study rooms of medical colleges the common snakes that are found in our region in india pakistan bangladesh there are either neurotoxic snakes or hemotoxic snakes neurotoxic snakes include cobra and crait Hemotoxic snakes include Russell's viper, saw-scaled viper, and pit viper. We'll discuss these snakes for a while. Neurotoxic snakes include cobra that has a classical, this two-eyed appearance with on a hood. This is a common snake in our region. Other than that, crait crait has white lines over it. These neurotoxic snakes cause severe pain and paralysis of the body patients will be having paralysis of the body weakness of the body they bite their predator and they, they paralyze him to death the first sign that you would see in these patients would be the eye signs in these patients you would be seeing ptosis you would be seeing diplopia ophthalmoplegia so these are the first signs that you need to observe after that the most life threatening thing that should be in your mind that this patient will now progress to respiratory paralysis and i have to save him before he progresses to respiratory paralysis and this is an indication that you have to give anti venom to this patient coming to the hemotoxic snake hemotoxic snakes include russell's viper and saw scaled viper russell's viper and saw scaled viper are hemotoxic snakes they make their prey bleed to death they cause coagulopathy they cause bleeding hemorrhage coagulopathy and the first sign that you would see in these patients would be that at the site of the bite mark if you see this patient would be bleeding from that bite mark or when you pass the iv line in these patients these patients will be bleeding from that iv line point or these patients might have developed conjunctival hemorrhages or hematuria these are the classical features these are the classical things that you should look at and the late signs would be that they these patients might be bleeding from their gums bleeding from the stools epistaxis bleeding from all pores of the body so these are hemotoxic snakes and remember russell's viper is a renal toxic it causes renal failure within hours remember r for russell's and r for renal failure these patients will have oliguria hyperkalemia and they might need dialysis otherwise they will die of the poison after you have shifted the patient to the hospital you have taken the vitals you have taken the single breath count you have taken the history you have known the type of snake now after understanding the mechanism of actions by which these snakes kill their prey now you can easily understand what investigations that you need to order you need to order bleeding profile cbc fibrinogen 
fibrinogen degradation product to see coagulopathy in hemotoxic snakes. You need to do urinalysis to see hematuria, bleeding in urine. You need to do RFTs for Russell's wiper. You need to do CPK levels. You need to do LFTs. So these investigations now make sense to you because you understand the way these snakes can kill a patient. What if you are in a periphery or a rural area where you do not have the facility of doing PTINR? What you can do is that you can take a clear bottle like this, clear transparent bottle, clean bottle like this, and put three to five cc of blood in it, and then place it undisturbed for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, if the blood gets clotted, it means coagulation profile is normal. But if the blood is still fluid after 20 minutes, it means that the patient has been bit by a hemotoxic snake. So this is the simple method with which you can check the bleeding profile of the patient. You take the labs and then you do local examination. You check the fang marks. Throbbing, burning sensation at the bite site is very common. If you see classical fang marks, classical fang marks are two bite marks, two teeth that have bit the patient. This is a classical fang mark. And most likely these snakes are venomous that leave a classical fang mark. Now we'll discuss that what is the difference between a fang mark of a venomous snake and a bite of a non-venomous snake. You can even spot that whether the patient has been bit by a venomous snake or a non-venomous snake by the mark it leaves. If the patient is bit by a venomous snake, it will have a classical two-point fang mark. And maybe or maybe not, you might be able to find a single row of teeth behind it. Most often you do not find the single row of teeth, but you see the classical two fang marks. In a patient with non-venomous snake bite, there will be two rows of teeth. The two rows of teeth show that the patient has been bit by a non-venomous snake. And most often what you would see is that there will be a presence of scratch. A scratch usually shows that the patient did not get a proper bite or it was a non-venomous snake. If there is a classical fang mark, it is a venomous snake. If, it is, if there are two rows or if there are scratches, it is a non-venomous snake. See, a venomous snake with two classical fang marks and a non-venomous snake with two rows of teeth. Remember, crate leaves no fang marks most of the time. Crate has very, very thin fangs and those thin fangs do not even leave a bite mark. You do local examination, you check the fang marks, then you see, look for erythema, swelling and blisters. Swelling is a very dangerous thing. If the patient had swelling in half of his limb and now the whole of the limb is swollen, it means that the, this patient has been bit by a venomous snake and he is going to die if you do not give him anti-snake venom. That is an indication for giving anti-snake venom if there is rapidly spreading swelling. You perform systemic examination. You look for bleeding from wounds and mouth. You look for neurotoxic signs like toxins, diplopia, facial weakness. You look for lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy is also important. If the patient has been bit on hand, check for auxiliary lymphadenopathy, cervical lymphadenopathy. If the patient has been bit on the leg, look for inguinal lymphadenopathy. Look for the signs of respiratory failure. Look for limb swelling. And if the patient is having severe limb swelling, you, you might even consider going for uh, fasciotomy because this patient can develop compartment syndrome. If the patient is in shock, you treat the shock. You treat the shock by giving fluids. You can put the patient on support. And then you have to make a decision that whether you have to give anti-snake venom to this patient or not. Not all patients ha have been bit by snakes that are venomous. Not all bites are venomous. So you have to decide that whether you have to give anti-snake venom or not. If the patient has classical fang marks, fast spreading, local swelling, tender lymph nodes, coagulopathy, neurotoxic signs like ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, impending respiratory failure, hypotension, shock, arrhythmia, hyperkalemia, rhabdomyolysis, muscle breakdown with an elevated CPK. These are all the indications that that patient deserves to get a polyvalent anti-snake venom. This is a commonly found polyvalent anti-snake venom. It is effective against four types of snakes, cobras, crates, 
saw skilled wiper and russell's wiper how to administer polyvalent anti snake venom remember that these anti snake venoms are prepared in other animals like horses so there is a tendency that they may cause allergic reaction in a patient and a phylactic shock in a patient so how do you administer polyvalent anti snake venom what you do is that you take 50 ml of anti snake venom and you dilute it in 500 to 1000 ml of either normal saline dextrose saline or dextrose water and you slowly start the iv infusion you can give antihistamine before it as a preventive measure for anaphylactic shock you must have antihistamine adrenaline hydrocortisone at hand when you are giving anti snake venom to this patient you should not start infusion if you do not have any one of these things if the patient develops anaphylactic reaction what you need to do is that you have to stop the anti snake venom infusion you have to give antihistamine adrenaline hydrocortisone and then you wait for some time if the patient gets better you slowly restart the infusion i have talked about anaphylactic reaction management in detail in a, in my video on emergency treatment of anaphylactic shock you can check out the link of that video in the description below anti venom dose can be repeated if the symptoms persist and with that when the patient has been bit every patient must receive tetanus prophylaxis and you can give prophylactic antibiotic even augmentin can do the job patient must be kept in the hospital for the next 24 hours if the patient has been bit by a neurotoxic snake and he is developing signs and symptoms of neurotoxicity you must give atropine and neostigmine to the patient and you must have the facility of mechanical ventilation if the patient gets into respiratory paralysis if the patient has been bit by a hemotoxic snake and patient's uh, blood is getting depleted what you need to do is that you have to give the appropriate blood products in summary we talked about reassurance and immobilizing the patient we talked about the types of neurotoxic snake we talked about hemotoxic snakes we talked about shifting the patient to the hospital and taking the labs we talked about the different bites that are venomous and non venomous we talked about local and systemic examination we talked about which patient needs to be given anti snake venom we talked about uh, if how to give anti snake venom and how to prevent anaphylactic reaction we talked about tetanus prophylaxis and antibiotics and we talked about keeping the patient under observation for next 24 hours if you liked my video please click on the subscribe button and check out my videos on emergency medicine the link of those videos is given in the description below thank you very much